LMB in Cambridge, mm -hmm. and by questions and answer. Um, please use the chat for posting questions and engage us in discussions. Um, I'm Alessandro, and today I will be your host, speaking from the Council Unit in Cambridge. And I would like to thank also Stephanie, Kurti, Nick, and the RMS for the organization. Uh, it is really a great honor to welcome our speaker, uh, Professor Petrasville, uh, who is joining us from Munich. Uh, Professor Petrasville studied physics in, and philosophy in Stuttgart at, and uh, my dear beautiful Göttingen, uh, where then she graduated in physics. Uh, Petra obtained her PhD at the Braunschweig Technical University, working on FCCS, also at MPI for biophysical chemistry in Göttingen. Uh, after a postdoctoral experience in, at Cornell, uh, she started her group in 1999 back in Göttingen, for then moving to Dresden as a chair of biophysics. Uh, Petra is director at the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry and a honorary professor at the University of Munich since 2012, and a member of the German National Academy of Sciences. Her scientific interests range from single molecule biophysics to the synthetic biology of reconstituted systems, and her work has been very influential as attested also by numerous prestigious awards. I'm just going to run through and speak to Petra's Daniel. talk. The, the please, the, Louise Stefan, could you please mute the uh, the microphone? So, anyway, Petra's talk today is entitled "New Concepts to Study Single Molecules on Membranes." And without any further ado, I would like to pass the stream to her, Petra. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me just share my screen and then start with the real stuff. Yeah, so um, I've lately not. Yeah talked too, too, too often on uh, microscopy conferences because um, since a couple of years uh, ago, I shifted not my interest, but my the, the majority of the work in the lab, um, not because I didn't like microscopy or didn't like uh, developing techniques. I still like it very much. I just felt that um, the biological uh, systems that I was trying to apply our technology to didn't really fit to the technology. So um, just a little, um, you know, recap about what, where I come from and what I've been doing. Uh, I'm basically a FCS person of the first hour and FCS, as you might know, um, is one of the single molecule technologies of the, of, the, of the late 90s that was developed then when single molecule fluorescence microscopy and spectroscopy became, uh, you know, the, the, the hottest topic. Um, FCS is in contrast to many other uh, single molecule techniques where you're really looking at uh, individual molecules and tracking them over time, as you've seen in my, you know, uh, you know my, my first slide, FCS is a technique which is operated in a confocal setting. So um, the, everybody knows the confocal microscope. I don't really have to explain it. The only difference between uh, an FCS setup and a confocal microscope setup is that in FCS, you don't really have to scan the beam. What you're doing is you're producing the confocal, the, the focal uh, spot. And then basically you're taking all the, the, the signal that you can harvest from your confocal spot, which is, I, I usually like to, you know, uh, depict it as a, a little uh, double cone about the size of a bacterial cell. Of course, we all know you can get it smaller and it doesn't really look like a bacterial cell, of course, but it's about the, the you know, that's the size we are about talking. And um, what FCS is doing is we are basically parking our, our confocal spot and not scanning it, and then just waiting for the molecules to pass by. And if you, if you put it in, a, in an aqueous environment, like a cell or any transparent fluid, um, you can actually witness the, the, the diffusing molecules pass by. And this uh, basically creates uh, bursts, fluorescent bursts. And FCS is actually just taking the temporal information from these bursts. We are not, you know, we are not dissecting the individual molecules and we are not looking at them, uh, you know, as they diffuse on. We just see them for the very time that they are in our little, you know, bacteria sized uh, confocal spot. But it's actually amazing what information you can still get from these molecules and what you can use it for. So what we, we did, so this is just the, the correlation uh, curve. I, I guess I'm, most of the people know this technique. It has been developed in the, in the early 70s already and then became famous in the, in the 90s. 
So what you're usually doing is you're basically taking the fluctuating uh, time signal and basically compare it with itself at different times. And that by this, you get decay functions, so-called correlation functions, which tell you something about the temporal um, in fingerprints of your of your molecules passing by. So this decay function basically tells you how long the molecules actually stay in the volume. So the half value decay time tells you about the, the average time that your fluorescent molecules are basically uh, what it takes them to cross by diffusion or other uh, dynamics cross our confocal spot. We are usually having a confocal you know, spots in the size of half a micron, uh, you know, normal, um, you know, um, diffraction limited spots. And with molecules in the fluid phase, we are always talking about time scales of about a millisecond. So that's about the time that the average molecule, of course, some are much faster, some are slower, dependent on the sizes, that the average molecule st stays in the volume. And of course, if you're measuring then over seconds and minutes, you are averaging over thousands and, and thousands of molecules. And by this, getting a very nice statistics, um, which is, of course, uh, you know, a distribution. Uh, some molecules are uh, just passing by at the little red ridge of the of the of the volume element, and some are going by through the uh, through the entire volume. So you're having an, uh, a distribution. And what you can use it for, of course, you can uh, determine diffusion coefficients of molecules, and that's pretty handy, uh, especially in cells where you have different uh, you know environments with different viscosities. Um, this is just a comparison of time scales or of our correlation, uh, you know, decay functions if you're looking at different sizes of molecules and different uh, environments of molecules, um, the smallest uh, molecules and, and, and diffusion times you usually get. Uh, are from dye molecules in solution that's the smallest but you know what you can see as a fluorescent signal, we are having a transit time of about open, only you know about 10, 10 microseconds. So this is, sorry, this is missing here. They're talking about milliseconds here. So this would be one millisecond, 100 uh, microseconds, 10 microseconds. Um, and very small dye molecules are diffusing, of course, very fast. And if you're looking at GFP, which is a protein, of course, much more bulky, a larger hydronomic radius, you would have about, you know, five times uh, slower diffusion. And if you compare diffusion of GFP in uh, water uh, or in buffer uh, as compared to a cytosol of cells, you know, average cells, average cytosol, again, we have a, a, de a, you know, a delay of about four to five due to viscosity in the cytosol. And a large shift you would see if the molecules are not diffusing in the cytosol, but in the membrane of cells. So of course, this is not a GFP here, but it's a, a dye I uh, diffusing in the membrane of, uh, you know, either model membranes or cell membranes, which is about 100 times far, uh, slower than uh, in the cytosol. So by this, you can actually very nicely uh, use FCS as a, as a method to determine where in the cell, in what kind of uh, environment your molecules are diffusing. And you can also use it for looking at, um, sorry, this I probably should say here, if molecules are binding to larger molecules, right? So if a, if a small molecule is binding a larger one, you would also see a shift in diffusion. If one molecule is binding the membrane, you would see a shift in diffusion. Lots of things where you can use FCS for. Um, and what you can also do, and that's of course uh, the nicest part, you can look at um, molecular interactions between two different species of molecules. And that's the, the very uh, topic that I worked on as a PhD, um, which is cross correlation spectroscopy. There you are actually, um, you're not dependent on the size and the, in the diffusion coefficients. And you're basically using the, um, the, the you know, the, the appearance of fluctuations in two different channels. So if you're comparing a, a red, uh, fluorescence uh, fluctuations in a, in a confocal microscope, which is illuminated by a green and a, a red laser. Um, so you have in one channel, you have the red fluctuations, in the other one, you have the green fluctuations. And if you have molecules that have basically that red, red and green, which are actually um, binding each other, you see um, coincident fluctuations in the green and the red at the same time. And that gives you a cross correlation um, signal which you can actually distinguish from uh, just the, the single free molecules in every um, 
every color channel. So this is something, and I'm not talking much more about it. This is something I developed long ago, <laughs> more than 20 years ago. Um, and you can use it to, to look at uh, molecular interactions in any environment. We do, did a two photon excitation, and then you can do it even nicer in embryos. You can go in deep tissue. And I would say the, 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 the best and most biological application that we had um, for this kind of technology was to study uh, receptor ligand interactions in living zebrafish embryo, early stages of embryos, they look like fish falls. That was a study that we did together with um, Michael Brandt in Dresden at that time. And uh, here you can actually see, we can distinguish different affinities of different receptors with uh, their ligands and the ligand was FGF8. And you can already see um, that the scattering of the data is really pretty high. I mean, usually FCS is a, is a, is a statistic technique and it has a relatively good um, you know, readout and a very good statistical significance, but cells are so dramatically ill you know, defined systems that in order to get uh, beautiful reproducible data with you know, error bars that are to totally freaked. <laughs> um, it's, it's nearly impossible. And that was the time when I decided that biology is not yet there <laughs> to be analyzed with our single molecule technologies. Now, the problem with biology, you can really not change it, right? I mean, biology is complex and um, single molecule measurements are very sensitive and you're picking up any kind of noise that you could dream of. And this is really almost impossible to make biology noiseless. So the, the question is, is there any biological system where it really makes sense and where you get, you know, a very, very good statistical quality with single molecule analysis? And I came to the conclusion there is none. And if you want to have a biological system where you can measure with confidence uh, on, on single molecules uh, and especially single molecule dynamics, you will probably have to build it because um, that's just the the problem with biology, it has been complexifying itself since about 3.5 billions of years. And uh, you cannot find a simple system anymore, right? If you, if you even look at the smallest organisms out there, um, you have about a thousand genes or so, um, and they are all messing up your, you know, your confidence because there's absolutely no way that you can keep all the parameters constant, but the one that you would like to change. And for that reason, we have already uh, about 20 years now, we have, uh, tried to build systems that are interesting, biologically interesting, meaning that ideally they would be alive, um, but they are very simple. And um, so since we don't find them out there in nature, we tried to, to build them from scratch. And of course the big unknown is how much complexity is actually required for a system to become alive. We don't know that. So all we can do is to build up you know, um, module for module um, systems that show emergent properties, which we actually expect to have uh, from living systems and try to see whether at some point these systems, you know, show very, very prominent features of living systems, such as a metabolism, ability to reproduce, uh, information containment, and maybe even uh, evolution towards, you know, new features. And of course we are not, even close to being there. Um, my group is particularly interested in building systems that are able to you know, self-divide because that's obviously one important requirement for you know, reproducibility, uh, 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 reproduction, um, that a system you know, divides into daughter compartments. So what we're doing um, is to, to build you know, vesicle-based protocells and we want to you know, uh, and analyze them uh, you know, and, 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 and build up a system with functional elements that are able to split um, a vesicle-based protocell. And um, that's a long way to go. Um, the first thing that you would ha have to do is to make this protocell recognize how large it is because otherwise it cannot split itself, right? So you would like to <laughs> have some sort of a system that controls at which size uh, a vesicle is undergoing a division. Now, if we're looking for simple, not 
simple enough, but simple biological systems and how they organize their division, you're obviously not looking into eukaryotic cells because they're horribly complicated. So you, you better go to prokaryotic cells, uh, ideally some that are relatively well understood like white mice in biology and E. coli is such a system. And E. coli regulates the, uh, the division uh, in a very interesting way. It basically only grows in length and uh, basically keeps track of its of its length by having oscillations of a protein machinery between the two poles and you know the longer it grows the longer the period of these oscillations will be and what these oscillations are doing they they tell the cell you know when it's about time to to divide uh, when they are long enough at a specific period and then the cell undergoes division in the way that it assembles uh, division machinery in the middle uh, of the compartment which is actually being washed away by this oscillating machinery here. Now, only if these oscillations are long enough uh, for the, you know, for the division machinery to, you know, to, to be able to assemble in the middle and attach to the membrane, then it can undergo division. So if, if, if the cell is too small, it's basically washing away the division machinery all the time. And if it's long enough, then it has time to, you know, assemble in the, you know, in the time between the, the this machinery being in one pole and press transiting to the other one. Now the machinery we are talking about is the min machinery and I guess a lot of people have already seen this beautiful data either in, uh, in vivo uh, from other people, the Boer uh, basically uh, saw it first time. Um, so the, the the really cool thing about this machinery, the min protein machinery, is it's really simple um, and in, in our quest for looking at simplistic uh, biological systems that's actually an ideal candidate. So what happens here? So it's it's basically a DNA, it's a, it's, a, it's an enzyme, uh, an ATPase, which upon um, ATP binding dimerizes and binds the membrane. It's a soluble molecule usually, and only if ATP is bound to it, it will basically bind the membrane. But it will not be able to dissociate again or to hydrolyze the, the ATP. It will basically require a helper. Uh, protein, and that's its antagonist, if you will, for the uh, for the self organization, um, which is called min e. And only if in if you have large quantities of min d already on the membrane, the min e will be recruited to the membrane, allowed to you know hydrolyze ATP, um, and then the whole machinery splits off. And um, that is basically what you see on the membrane. So here you see first of all this um, min d will bind, and it will bind to one pole. And it will only if the pole is almost, you know, coated entirely with the molecules, then the, uh, the mean E will come and dissociate away uh, by helping ATP hydrolysis all of the molecules so that they go in solution and, you know, attach again at the other pole. And this, as I said, this machinery is basically is, is, is preventing uh, the set ring, uh, mainly the FDS set to form wherever you have a large coverage here. Okay, so to, to, to cut a long story short, what we did, and that was particularly Martin Lose who set that up in my lab, um, basically to reconstitute this pole-to-pole -pole oscillations. First of all, we purified the proteins and, um, and looked at them uh, on a 12 microscope. Um, if you add ATP and membrane where they can attach to, you see this beautiful, um, you know, traveling waves, which are, you know, just the pole to pole oscillations without a compartment. So here you cannot turn around because there's no boundary. And you should not be uh, fooled into thinking that you have an active, you know, an active movement here of the molecule. They're not directionally transported. What they do is they, they dissociate, they, they, they bind and dissociate, you know, um, like a La Ola wave traveling uh, through a, a football stadium. Um, so you're basically binding on one side and dissociating on the other one. And it's published in many, many different papers. So if you haven't seen it and haven't heard about it, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you can read. Um, and um, what is interesting, and that's particularly interesting to us because um, we are single molecule people, uh, you can look at these molecules in a single molecule way. Um, so here you can beautifully see that the, the single molecules of both, mole both species, the min D and the min E, they don't, you know, travel directionally, uh, they, they just bind, diffuse a bit and then dissociate again. And only the, you know, the processive binding and dissociation gives the impression of a traveling wave. 
Now, um, that is something that is very interesting to understand. Um, of course, we, um, we wanted to see whether we could also reconstitute the oscillations, um, but there we needed, uh, you know, a sufficiently similar uh, geometry. This was Katja Ziske, which, he, which uh, you know, implemented that in our lab. If you, if you add the FDS set, which is the machinery that's positioned by the min waves, on the, on the supported membranes, you can see these little red things are the FDS set polymers and the green uh, are the min proteins. And you can see that indeed, as predicted, um, if you look at them, the, the green min waves really push away the FDS set from the membrane and basically um, prevent it from hydrolyzing into or, or this, you know, uh, assembling into larger um, polymers. But now if you bring them in, uh, in little, you know, uh, these are bathtubs, basically. These are these are um, uh, PDMS uh, printed uh, polymer, uh, you know, uh, structures that we could line out with membrane just to make sure that we have exactly the same geometry as a as a um, as a bacterial cell. If if we fill in in these polymer, uh, you know, uh, compartments, our our min proteins, you can beautifully see that it looks almost the same as the bacterial cell. And what is really striking is that it also shows this dependence on the um, on the length for the pole to pole oscillation period. And we found that uh, in, at about a, a length at which you see the real cells divide, you can see that already the min oscillations split up in, in daughter oscillations, although there's no, um, of course, there's no uh, splitting going on here. This is a fixed uh, volume. But what you can see in these compartments is that if you have them sufficiently large, we will see uh, over time for the min proteins, a, a real dip in concentration in the middle. And consequently, we see that if we add now our FDSZ polymers, as we have them here, if we add them to the compartment, they can actually really form uh, little ring-like structures, not full rings because it's open on top here, uh, but we can see them uh, forming, you know, going to the middle, finding the middle and basically forming their proto uh, rings there. So it, it, the, the machinery is super simple, but it works. Um, we played around with the mins, of course. Uh, I mean, have you, if you have such a beautiful machinery in hand, you, you try to find out what you can do with it. We found that the, the you know, the pattern forming ability of these min uh, proteins depend very strongly on the membrane affinity. Of course, also on the ATP hydrolysis of the min D, but also on the membrane affinity and especially of the min E, which is a little helper protein. And you could see that if this is the wild type and these are the oscillation wild type, if you have only one amino acid change in the, in the membrane targeting he, uh, helix of the min E, you can see that the, um, the patterns look quite different. They're still there, but they are messed up and the pole-to-pole os -pole oscillation is no longer there. So this, if you would have that in a cell, uh, a living um, organism, this, this mutation would not be able to position their division machinery. Um, interestingly, you could cut the membrane uh, binding sequence totally away from the min-E. You could basically render this molecule not membrane attached anymore, and it still forms patterns. Um, however, the, the, you know, the the oscillation phenotype is completely messed up. So now you have almost like a top to bottom oscillation. But interestingly enough, I mean, you, you don't have that molecule to, to, you know, you can simplify it. You don't even have to have it in the membrane. And that was something we, we, we found very intriguing. And there's another feature which we didn't understand much about this min E, which is that um, in order to, to, you know, catalyze ATP hydrolysis in the min D, it also has to be you know, flipped into a, in a conformational change into an open and active form. It usually in a late, in, 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 solu in solution, it's usually in a latent form. It's basically, you know, sipped up. And only if it feels the presence of a large, you know, concentration of min D on the membrane, it will basically um, do a structural rearrangement in an open uh, form. And only then it will be able to, uh, you know, initiate uh, ATP hydrolysis in the min D. And that's a complication which we didn't really understand. Why does it have to do that, right? In principle, it just catalyzes this one. So why does it have to be closed and opened up? And so we cloned, a, 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 you know, a constitutive, that was Simon Kretschmer who did that, um, constitutively uh, open uh, form that was, again, much simpler than the, 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 the whale type. 
And we still saw patterns of that molecule. The only problem was that the patterns were only observed in a very shallow, very narrow uh, concentration regime. Uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you add min D to min E, you have to match exactly a specific uh, ratio, otherwise it will not give you patterns. And if you compare the wild type, which is super robust against um, concentration changes, where you can go about almost two orders of magnitude larger in, in variation, then you can appreciate why you know, nature chose to make the system so complex because it's more robust, right? So you, if you have this, you know, this min E, which needs to be activated, then you can be much, much uh, you know, generous in terms of keeping concentration ratios. But that's uh, for a you know for a simplistic approach which we have where we want to see what is the minimal approach for the system to order at all or what is the minimal system that gives you pattern formation we could live with this one right we would not have to have the complex native one and uh, this even it goes further right so in addition to the to the membrane targeting and the conformational switch which we found to be you know um, not required. Um, it also has a dimerization unit, a molecule that usually forms dimers, and we wanted to know whether you can also get that away and make the, you know, make the molecule even simpler, just a, a sm the small ATPA simulation helix, which is re required for interacting with MD. Now, the not so good news is that you cannot also, uh, oh, I didn't. Oh, here we are. You cannot only uh, you cannot take every, everything but the helix um, because then you will not get patterns anymore. But the good news is that you can complement the helix with a membrane target or with a dimerizing uh, unit, and in both cases you get um, uh, self-organization and patterns. And what is even nicer is you don't have to use the native. Uh, membrane targeting sequence or the native dimerization unit. You just have to implement the feature of membrane attachment or dimerization and how you implement it is completely up to you. And that was shown, this was actually shown up by, by Philip Glock, a very, very good biochemist who did that. And uh, Tamara Hirman picked it up and, 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 and wanted to, to see how, how simple your dimerizing unit could be. And she should chose, for example, a single-stranded DNA, um, and she show, showed that you can use a, a hybrid from the, the helix, the mean E helix, and a little DNA, uh, and have the complementary DNA on the other one. And that hybrid, which is no longer a protein, but a, a little peptide with a DNA, still gives patterns, right? So we, we have now significantly simplified the pattern-forming system, uh, the mean system. And that's, of course, beautiful, because that means that there's really hope to construct biological features. I mean, here in this case, it's just uh, the ability to, to, you know, form patterns, but a very important ability if you want to uh, go on and build systems like a self-division. So we are, we are relatively optimistic that this minimal approach is, is a good one. Um, but um, on the way, uh, of analyzing our min protein system, uh, Tamara did something really cool. Now, probably I should, this, I, I don't know why I did not insert the picture one again. Um, I mean, if you look at the, the min protein system in this single molecule, sorry about that, in the single molecule representation here, it's very obvious if you want to understand it quantitatively, um, in principle, what you have to analyze is the, um, this, this uh, time scale of um, binding and dissociation. Right, so that, that if, if you really want to know the dynamics of what's going on, you would actually need to analyze in equilibrium the binding affinity to the membrane by looking at the attachment and dissociation. And interestingly enough, there's no real measure, uh, method out there that allows you to really address this time scale in equilibrium. Of course, you can do it in imaging, in single molecule imaging or tracking, but this is a relatively low statistical uh, relevance that you get there. That's uh, a lot of data and very little information. So Tamara, who actually made this, sorry, I don't want to uh, make you dizzy, but I just need to go back to, <laughs> to this slide here. Tamara uh, implemented a very, very interesting new uh, technique, which is out there at the moment under the title of fast mass photometry, and you probably heard about it. Um, it's it's, it's uh, based on the eye scat, on a scattering phenomenon. In principle, you can, if you have a very sensitive uh, optical readout, you can actually 
um, observe scattering signals from single molecules on uh, membranes. And uh, Philip Kukura from Oxford, he actually built that into a really cool um, measurement system, which is now even sold um, as a, it's now even, you know, uh, you can purchase it as a, as a, as a, as a um, an instrument, a standalone instrument, which is able to measure the masses of molecules if they are basically falling down on glass uh, slides. And we thought that this would be a fantastic technique to actually give us access to our you know, association and dissociation times constants. And Tamara, um, together with Philip uh, and, and his uh, host of uh, Nick Hund, um, developed this into a really cool analysis system where we can track not only um, molecules that are not labeled um, uh, on the membrane, not only track their size and their, um, and their uh, position with uh, single molecule uh, tracking, but also as they grow you know, in, in, in numbers. So uh, the mean proteins, as I, I told you, is, is, it's, it's basically coming as a dimer and then it's growing into a large filament on the membrane that's relatively clear. We were not able so far to really understand exactly how um, these this, uh, polymers are growing, but the ice get, or as we call it now, a mask sensitive particle tracking, because it's basically something where you track the particles on a membrane, can give you exactly that information. It can tell you how the molecules come, what size they have, how they grow in the membrane, and when they dissociate again. So we have all the parameters in there that we need to address um, our mean system quantitatively. And this is at the moment uh, impressed with nature methods. And I, I'm, I'm actually super happy that this method, which doesn't even need uh, uh, any kind of labeling, um, can be applied to the mean proteins, which are relatively small proteins. But of course, as I'm an FCS person, so uh, what I always wanted to have is an FCS-based uh, version of, uh, you know, uh, de uh, um, determining uh, the time it takes for a molecule to, to come and leave a surface. And in principle, you can also um, com compile FCS into, uh, or, 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 you know, change FCS into this um, uh, feature. As you as you might know, uh, in FCS you have your Normally in, in, in confocal FCS, you have your volume and you're now analyzing the, um, the transits of single molecules through this volume. And you're analyzing this by fluctuations in the fluorescent signal in this small confocal volume. But if you do not have a confocal volume, but a surface, in principle, you can do the same thing. The only difference is that you're now not averaging over the signal in a, in a confocal volume, you're averaging over the signal of the whole plane. And if you're illuminating it with a turf, you can see the molecules only on the surface. So you can basically take the fluorescence signal when a molecule comes and leaves as the fluctuation in time that corresponds to the K on and the K off. So we basically tried to do that um, with a very well controlled system um, where we had DNA, uh, you know, attached to the surface and then had a fluorescent, um, you know, oligos binding to the docking string. And of course, if you make them small enough, you will continuously exchange these uh, immature strands. That's exactly the setting that a paint microscopy, as uh, my colleague Ralf Jungmann has uh, pioneered, is using to do uh, high resolution imaging. But we are not interested in the location, we are interested in the time scale. And if you have, uh, if you're con basically conceiving such a system, you have exactly this on, uh, you know, on a single molecule, they are coming and leaving. And this time scale here gives you exactly the, um, the, the numbers of K on and K off that you would like to have. And if you then titrate the concentrations, you can even, uh, you know, dissect the two, die K on and K off. So all you have to do in terms of, um, you know, computation is to, you know, integrate over the whole surface and do a time correlation of this integrated signal. And if you do so, you get correlation curves where the, the decay function reflects exactly on the, the bright time of the molecules in average um, over your surface and over time. 
And as I said, you can now titrate the concentrations and you will see that, of course, it depends on the concentration because the K-on uh, will decrease if you have higher concentration. So you can separate K-on and K-off. And we can see, for example, by this also the diff very different affinities of uh, sequences of different lengths, right? So you have for a, a seven uh, nucleotide overhang, you have, uh, you know, um, signal you have about, this is now six seconds, this have the fractions of a second. And if you have very long 10 nucleotide uh, overlap, you have basically a hundred seconds. So you have to measure, of course, obviously very long in order to resolve the signal, but um, you can nicely do that. So you can also use FCS, uh, in particularly this surface dependent FCS. And my uh, students, Johannes Stein and Florian Steer have actually shown that you can not only, um, so that the, the primary, um, um, the primary uh, constants that you can get from this localization-based FCS are the K on and K off. But since FCS has also an amplitude, the curve has an amplitude which reflects on the concentrations, you can also say something about the number of binding sites. So this is very beautiful. So FCS can also be used uh, in addition to the mass sensitive particle tracking. But still, I would say that the particle tracking, especially if you want to observe uh, growth sizes, uh, might be the, the more uh, readily usable technique for this kind of um, analysis of processes on uh, surfaces. Um, oh God, I'm already, you know, uh, over my time here. Um, but let me show you something that we show uh, that we that we observed in the min proteins, which we did not expect at all, um, because we expected the system as was basically proposed in vivo to position the machinery for cell division, which it does, as you've seen in this, uh, you know, in this compartments. But Bea Ram, uh, a fantastic PhD student who did a lot of work on the means. She actually found out that the mean proteins do something very funny. They position molecules that are actually diffusing on the membranes, um, independent on any, uh, you know, um, functional overlap with uh, with um, with the means. So this is a streptavidin molecule. Don't forget this. this I'm not talking about this here, but we we have a, a streptavidin um, which is bound to the membrane by two um, uh, lipid anchors, cannot leave the membrane and will be pushed around by the mean proteins in the way that it is actually really, um, here you can see this very beautifully, the mean proteins are propagating waves and they're pushing the streptavidin out of their way. So you're actually creating void zones on the membrane, although there's no functional you know, dependence on streptavidin, uh, of streptavidin on, on the means. And if you want to, you know, rationalize what's going on, so the mean waves, because they're so such a massive, uh, you know, uh, polymeric uh, machinery on the membrane, they are actually act acting as a ratchet mechanism. So they, they do not allow the molecules on the membrane to diffuse in both directions anymore. And by this pump it almost in one direction, directionally, and of course, upon energy dissipation. So it's a, a real active transport. Uh, induced by the means. And we can actually see that it depends on the size of your molecules, how far and how efficient they will be pushed out of the way. So you can almost do it something to, to do some sort of a, a, a theoretic transport. Um, here we have uh, origami just to have massive things with two membrane uh, anchors and origami with 42 membrane anchors. So these ones will be relatively lowly uh, interacting with the means, you know, mechanically on the surface. However, these ones are, be, are, are, are acting as real, you know, obstacles for the means. And you can see that these ones will be much more efficiently pushed away. So here you can see that uh, in this, in this uh, I think, very beautiful image where the, the, the green ones are the mean proteins, the, the magenta ones are the, you know, these ones with only two anchors, and the, the blue ones are the, you know, this, this cargo which, which is pushed very efficiently. And the process which is underlying all this is a diffusophoresis, and that was also recently published in Nature Physics. Um, so they can quantify, quantitatively understand that. That was actually the, the team of Erwin Frey, who um, is in the theoretical biophysics here in Munich, who delivered the, the, the theoretical uh, fundament for this. And now I would like to stop and uh, <laughs> not challenge the you know, easy part of the, of the event. 
Um, our many collaborators, I would like to thank Erwin Frey, who did a lot of theory for us and with us, uh, Ralf Jungmann, who is a very uh, active collaborator on the DNA paint and uh, on FCS on membranes, and uh, particularly Philipp Kukura and Nick Hund uh, on the development of the ISCAT based uh, techniques, and Haman Rivas, a long-term long collaborator on bacterial cell division. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Now I'm excited to, to see what the next steps are in, my, uh, in, this, in this event. Thank you, thank you very much for the uh, amazing uh, presentation. I was uh, hypnotized in front of some of the of the movies. Uh, I, I must admit, I, I had because it's different from what I do. I hadn't followed your more recent uh, research, and uh, it's, even uh, better than it's not so boring for you. <laughs> I was, uh, it was 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 was, was great. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we can give a little bit of time to reorganize for questions, some, uh, to see also if there are more questions, giving the word to Nick for the Mentimeter. All right, so uh, Petra, if you could unshare, thanks very much. I'll just share my screen now. There we go. And, uh, Right, so you should see this uh, single molecule methods in cell biology is revolutionized. So while people are, are signing on, the link to Mentimeter is in the chat. Um, we can we can offer their comments on this one. Um, so I hope can you see that all? Yeah. Yep. Good. Yeah, yeah, all good. Okay, so uh, you should see the link. I've got first person in. <laughs> I must say. Um, Petra, it was a, you were refreshingly candid about how difficult single molecule methods are actual, actually are in, in real cell cellology. So thanks very much for that. Um, and yeah, I mean, what fantastic work. I mean, it's really amazing. So, okay, we've got a few people in. Um, we'll wait a bit longer to see if we can get a few more contestants in. Any more people? We've got plenty of people in the in the. Uh... So yes, for, for those of you that didn't do before, so in the chat there is the link to the Mentimeter. Yep. Ah, okay. So yeah, I should have said that again. So it's in there. We just. Ah, uh, you probably have to. Uh, there's not. There's a blank missing between here and the link. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Ah, uh, yeah, that's again, it's uh, <laughs> the... Oh, you can play your own competition. I'm afraid I've had to ask, I've, I've had a, quite a lot of wrong Wait. answers. So <laughs> hopefully they are wrong. <laughs> Today we have uh, more shy people. That's what it's... <laughs> yeah. Let's try and get at least 10 participants because it's a bit more fun when you have a more, uh, more people riding, racing each other. So come on. <laughs> Come on, a few more people. Oh yeah, one more. Uh, for, the, <laughs> just for the for the fun of it and uh, and uh, for the foldoscope, yes. Oh, if yeah. you really need a high tech microscope at home, uh, you can do great science with the foldoscope. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is the prize that you really want. <laughs> okay. Well, we eight nine. Oh yeah, it could get there. Okay, maybe maybe we can we can go ahead. You want to start? All right, let's start then. Nothing is funny. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. Well. Okay, we've got a few people in here, and uh, here we go. First question. Oh no, the grand, no. I can't start. That. Press enter. Um, oh, there we go. So, what is the standard setup in, in which fluorescence correlation spectroscopy FCS is performed? The wide field fluorescence, phase contrast setup, polarization setup, dark field setup, or confocal setup? The answer quickly. You're, on, you're racing against the clock. 
Bang, time's up. And here's our leader bottle. We've got six, six correct answers so far. We some people have been listening and see what we got. <laughs> this, is, this is really funny. Beavies. Well, we don't, but everyone's neck and neck, so <laughs> we can, there's all to go for here. Okay. What parameters are primarily to be determined by a localization based FCS? So that's surface binding dynamics, K on, K off, molecular brightness, membrane potential, lipid charge. Let's see who's got this one, who's been awake. And. Oh, five good answers. Okay, excellent. Let's see what the leaderboard says now. Ah, Tanoi has raced into the lead there. So, <laughs> Helen, you're very, you're very close. So keep at it. CBS is a okay, okay. Next question. Go on. Oh, I think it skipped one. Okay, here we go. What labels are required in order to study proteins by mass photometry? That's fluorescently labeled antibodies, gold beads, GFP tags, no labels at all, or snap tags. And there we go. No labels at all. Most people have definitely been listening to Petra. <laughs> okay, let's see where we are with the leaderboard. Oh, wow, neck and neck. Three very close people there. So it's all to go for. And first, what's the main physiological role of the E. coli min CDE system? To introduce cell lysate, to neutralize bacteriophage in replication, to position the division mid cell, to replicate DNA, to replicate RNA. And it is to position the division to the mid cell. All right. And here we are. Let's see where we are now. Oh, Ambria has. Oh, wow. Helen's back in the lead. Well, all right. Maybe CVS, RD, and Ambria can uh, catch up with the last question. Let's see. And that is, what is the underlying mechanism by which min proteins can directionally transport other molecules on membranes? Electrophoresis, diffusiophoresis, active transport, thermophoresis, or anomalous subdiffusion. I have to apologize for the size of the labels. I just cannot make those bigger. Oh, and we have got diffusiophoresis. Four people got that one right. Okay, let's see who is the eventual winner. Oh. oh. Helen retains her lead, so well done, Helen. If you could just let us know in the chat your uh, contact details, the great folder scope will be winging its way to you soon, all right? So thanks very much for competing there. This is so cool. I, I didn't I didn't know what to expect when I delivered the questions. I, I, I'm sorry I gave you such a long question. Oh, that's fine. Actually, your questions are very good. That, that, is, really very good. Good. Wow. that is really cool. That's perfect. Really cool. Congratulations to the winner. You really paid attention. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. thank you, Nick. Thank you for everyone that participated. And I would like to so there is a question from Paula that Paula Borri. If yes, very uh, good question is I, I saw it. Yes, um, I mean we, I, we can basically can be in, in video as well. So yeah, hi Paula. Yes, hello, hi, hi Petra. Hi Paula. Hi, 
Um, yes, excellent talk. I'm really interested in the topic and I'm also very interested in the work from Philip Kukura and the ice cap and mass photometry. But yes, as I was saying in the chat, is the membrane supported or suspended? And I guess with the- In the, in the, S, in, in the mass uh, photometry application, we have a supported membrane. Um, yes. uh, of course, it would be fantastic to do that on a suspended membrane. I mean, uh, usually, I mean, the, the mean proteins work on any membrane, right? You can do a suspended, you can coat it, you can, it's very nice. But um, the problem is that, I mean, in order to get a scattering signal really without a, a lot of background, you have to have a very flat surface. Yes. And um, of course, uh, so far we use really uh, glass uh, supports. We haven't really played to the, you know, to the strength of the technique. Um, of course, ideally, you would like to do it on, on, on cell membranes. And I guess the uh, technology development, uh, especially also from the iSCAT people, will continue. Um, our, you know, the only difference that we added, or the only thing that we added to this technology, which was already, uh, you know, uh, published and, and introduced, was to have the membrane there and to adapt our uh, algorithms to, you know, this growing uh, sizes. So our, our application is really the first where you could see how, you know, this, this thing is actually growing and, and, or, and moving. So that's basically only real uh, you know uh, additional uh, technology that or method that we added there but other than that i'm actually very optimistic that the optics people uh, will yes. make progress to bring yes. that to the next level yes yeah i mean this is also an area of interest in, in my lab we are trying to push the technique to suspended rather yes. than supported membranes so um, but yes, I was wondering also from the maybe biology, biophysics of the of the proteins, whether there is a difference. There is, there's no difference. difference. So, um, I mean, we have not yet seen, I mean, there might be a little bit of a difference that the patterns look a bit different uh, if you have a, a freestanding membrane as compared to a supported membrane, but because the mean proteins are actually only binding on to the, to one the, the, uh, to the yeah. you know, head group region, it's yeah. not so much feeling the the yeah, the adhesion. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paola. Is, um, so I do, people feel free to post uh, last moment questions. I, I, I do have one, which is, uh, I don't know if I can formulate it properly. So I, I, I'm actually, I'm always very interested in uh, cellular decisions and, uh, you know, the biochemical determinant of cellular decisions. Um, and uh, I, I think so. What you have shown is, uh, you know, is uh, really how biochemistry is using, you know, spatial temporally um, patterning of biochemical reactions actually um, mediate a cellular decision. Yes. So when and where. Okay. Yes. To, yes. To speak. Uh, what I couldn't find in the literature uh, so far, and I don't know, I would like your suggestion if there is a sufficient mathematical framework, oh, not, yeah. not, not about the, just the diffusion, yes, but even just the principles of, uh, you know, biological computation. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, but biological computation, I mean, there are many ways of doing a biological computation, but this whole the reaction diffusion is a huge, a huge, uh, you know, uh, literature about it. I mean, there was a Turing paper early on uh, in 51, who lined out the, you know, how, how, how morphogenesis can arise from uh, reactions, from chemical reactions, which is, I think, the, a very nice paper to introduce because it's not so mathematical. I mean, it is mathematical, but not, but not you know, it, it can still be understood by normal people. Um, but since then, a lot of uh, theory groups have followed up on that. And, uh, you know, the, the, there's a huge literature. Uh, so, so you, I mean, if you, if you follow the work of Carsten Kruse, who was basically the first one who did that with us, and also Alvin Frey, um, I mean, these are my colleagues that I collaborated with, but there are many others uh, who have looked at this system from the theory side. And um, it's, it's a very, very nice uh, system where you can, you know, try out a lot of different modeling with it. Yes, 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 I agree. Thank, thank you for the, 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 the suggestion. And then another thing um, is, uh, you know, these the, the gradient formations. And uh, so very often, uh, particularly at the very early times of uh, gradient formation for morphogenesis and so on, was considered kind of a, you know, a passive uh, formation of a gradient. Yes. So there is a, there is a source and then there is a larger yeah. sink. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
do you think that uh, this uh, active formation of gradients is uh, more the you know the default or or is the exception so is uh, because my impression is that most of the systems the biological system that we study nowadays are actually our gradients are formed actively by interactions of proteins i mean you will always have to I mean, if you really want a pattern formation, you will always have to kind of beat entropy. And that is always, you know, uh, that is always kind of using energy in, in one way or the other to, uh, to maintain the gradients. Of course, you can get these stochastic things, right? But if you want to really maintain something against <laughs> mixing and against decay, you will have to invest any, any kind of energy. So um, all these important processes are all active. Okay, yes, yes, that's great. Okay, so um, I guess that also we um, we are running out of time. And uh, so I would say that probably just before closing the meeting, uh, I wish to remind you, um, we'll next meet next, next Monday, we'll meet same time for a chat with the Professor Vigi Dravian from Queen Mary London. Uh, Vigi will discuss the microscopy techniques to image photosensitive samples. So I guess that uh, with this, I only have the time to thank Petra and everyone else, uh, Petra for her engaging and re really stunning presentation. And thank you all for the participation uh, yeah, today. Thank you very, very much, Petra. That was really and interesting. Thank, thank you. you. It, it was a lot of fun. And I, I will definitely tell my people who have not yet seen your, uh, your channel to visit it. <laughs> Maybe thank to you. also win a microscope. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. Thank Bye. you. Have a good day to everyone. Bye.